Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining. Um, welcome to this Francis Taylor Building Public Law webinar. Uh, today's topic is the Public Sector Equality Duty. Um, just to introduce myself, my name is Flora Curtis, and I'm a barrister at Francis Taylor Building and a member of the Public Law Practice Group, and I'll be chairing today's session. Um, just some admin, if you have any questions during the seminar, please ask them using the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Um, our speakers will try and answer as many of your questions as possible at the end of the three talks, uh, but we will be stopping at around two o'clock. So if you have any burning questions that haven't been answered, um, feel free to email those through to me or one of the speakers and we will try to answer them. Uh, just to let you know as well, we are recording this webinar and it may be published on the FTB YouTube channel. Um, so as I said, today's topic is the public sector equality duty, and our speakers will be giving an overview of the duty as well as giving an update on recent important case law. Um, we have three speakers from FTB today. Our first speaker is Michael Feeney. Uh, Michael was called to the bar in 2021, and since starting with FTB, he's already developing a strong practice across all of Chambers practice areas. Um, in public law, he's developing his practice advising and acting in judicial and statutory review proceedings. Michael will today be giving a helpful overview of the public sector equality duty and the key case law, as well as speaking on case law um, about when a breach of the public sector equality duty can be cured. Uh, so, Michael, I'll hand over to you. Great. Thank you, Flora. I'll just share my screen. I think hopefully everyone's seeing uh, a slideshow now. And so I will just. Okay, so here we go. This is what I'm going to be covering in my 15 minutes or there or thereabouts today. So as Flora said first, I'm going to just cover the basics quite quickly, uh, section 149 and the main principles. And then in the second half, I'm gonna be looking at what happens if the public sector equality has been breached. Uh, is there anything that a public authority can do about it afterwards? So first going straight to section 149, uh, this is the, uh, of course, where the public sector equality duty comes from. And essentially there are three limbs to the PSED. Uh, it requires public authorities to have regard to three different things. First, uh, to eliminate discrimination, harassment, victimization. The second is to advance equality of opportunity between those who share relevant protected characteristics and those who don't. The protected characteristics are listed elsewhere in the Equality Act <clears throat> and they include they include age, disability, uh, race, sex, sexual orientation. And then the final one is the need to foster good relations. Usually uh, when we're thinking about public law challenge, it's normally the second two in particular that come up in public law challenges, although sometimes the first is there as well. And I just wanted to touch briefly as well for the second requirement, advancing equality of opportunity, Section 149 then gives three things um, that are included within that. It's not exhaustive, uh, but they're examples of what advancing quality of opportunity uh, entails as well. So I'm not going to read out what's on the slide. They're there for you to read. But essentially, as well as addressing the specific statutory criteria, whenever you're seeking to discharge the public sector quality duty, it's also a good idea to address these particular um, guidance, as it were, that's within the statutes itself, saying what that entails as well. So turning from the statutes from Section 149, we're going uh, to be looking at the main principles of the public sector quality duty. And a useful starting place for this is, the case, is a case called Bracking, which is in the course of appeal. And at paragraph 25 of his judgment, Lord Justice McCoon sets out a whole series of principles that are applicable to the public sector of quality duty. It's important to remember that that bracking doesn't replace the statute. <laughs> the statute is still, of course, always the most important thing to look at. Uh, and sometimes in the case law, you can hear judges getting a little bit exasperated at having bracking cited at them again and again. But it is a useful starting point and a useful summary. 
So I'm going to run through the main principles that uh, you get from bracking. The first is that uh, evidential element in demonstrating that you've discharged the PSED is recording the steps you've taken. And also that the duty has to be exercised in substance with rigor. It's not about ticking boxes. And so the main practical point to be taken from this is that carrying out an equality impact assessment is not a requirement of public sector equality duty because it's not just about ticking boxes. And so you can fulfill the public sector equality duty without an EIA and without referring to the statutory criteria. But in practice, it's going to be much easier to show that you've discharged the PSED if you do carry out an assessment and you do refer explicitly to the statutory criteria. Likewise, of course, just because you've done an EIA, it doesn't mean you have discharged the public sector equality duty because there might be deficiencies within that EIA, which mean that you haven't done what you're supposed to do. The second main principle from bracking is that it's a personal duty. So it's upon the minister or decision maker personally, and they can't be taken as knowing absolutely everything that uh, people have told them or that they're, or rather that their officers know. And then the second rather obvious point, which is a subset of this, is that anyone reporting to a minister or public authority can't just tell them what they want to hear, has to tell them what's actually going on. So in practice, in planning, uh, quite often this will be committee members who are making planning decisions. And so they'll be the ones who actually need to know uh, what's going on, and they'll be the ones who actually need to discharge the PSED. I see there's a question, but I think uh, maybe I'll go to the end and then we can uh, see if there's time to answer questions then. But but feel free, of course, to just write them in the Q&A as they pop into your head. Then the third main principle, which I'm not going to talk about very much because I know that Mero is going to be speaking about this a bit more, but essentially is that the concept is you need to have due regard to the statutory criteria. So the duty is not a duty to reach a particular decision. It's a duty to take particular things into account. And the weight to give those considerations is a matter for the decision maker. And it's not for the courts to decide what weight those criteria should have as long as they've been duly and conscientiously taken into account. The fourth main principle is that the PSAD involves a duty of inquiry. This is essentially an extension of the usual public law principle that if you don't have enough information, a public authority is under reasonable steps to get that information. So for the PSAD, it's not good enough to say, we don't really know, we don't have that information. If it's been raised, then there's a duty to take reasonable steps to acquire that information. So often for the PSED, that will be surveys, consultation. Once a consultation has been undertaken, then of course, there's a legal obligation to conscientiously take the consultation responses into account in order for it to be a lawful consultation. And then the final principle from bracking, and this is what I'm going to be spending the rest of my time talking about, is the concept of a rearguard action sometimes referred to as well as curing a breach. So in bracking, uh, Lord Justice McComb cited the case of uh, Carr and Shah, and he said essentially that the PSED has to be discharged before a decision is taken. Once there's been a concluded decision, you can't just do it afterwards and save a breach of the PSED. And I'm going to focus on this point because this is actually, uh, in subsequent case law, has been doubted. And it's important to be aware of because bracking is cited and used so often as a summary of the relevant principles that for this one, it's important to be aware that subsequent case law has doubted it. So going into the subsequent case law, um, the first case uh, I'm going to mention is uh, Pritchard and Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, where Mrs. Justice Lang addressed um, Carr and said that this case was wrong. And essentially, Mrs. Justice Lang said it shouldn't be relied on because in Carr, the point was conceded. There was no argument about whether you could cure a breach of the PSED. Um, it was accepted by the defendant. And also, and perhaps more importantly, 
Um, that case, Carr, didn't actually concern the Equality Act. You can see that case was from 2008. The Equality Act is from 2010. It concerns precursor legislation. And so uh, Mr. Justice Lang said that Carr was wrong and that bracking, inciting Carr and relying on it, um, should be treated with caution. So then turning to how that works in practice, the case of Metropolitan Housing Trust, uh, unsurprisingly, given what's often involved in possession proceedings, there's a lot of cases on the PSAD and position, possession proceedings. And in this case, a housing trust brought possession proceedings against a schizophrenic tenant living in mental health supported accommodation. And they breached their public sector equality duty because before doing so, um, they didn't have regard to an up-to-date psychiatric report. What happened at trial was that the decision maker at trial, while giving evidence, um, said that if he'd been aware of the psychiatric report, he wouldn't have started possession proceedings. Now, somewhat surprisingly, you might think, the trial judge found that this corrected and remedied the breach of the public sector equality duty. The trial judge said that, well, it has been taken into account now. So on the particular facts of this case, Lord Justice McGee did quash the decision, found that there had been a breach of the PSAD, which hadn't been cured, because he said expecting a witness to carry out an assessment in the witness box is not what the Act has in mind for the rigorous, open-minded consideration of the statutory criteria. But on the general principle, he said, well, I don't think there's really anything wrong in general in referring to compliance with the public sector equality duty as remedying or curing the breach. So he said, in principle, you can do it. It's just in this case, they hadn't done it. And so turning then to uh, a planning case, example where this has been applied in the planning context. And so in this case, uh, Secretary Say against West Berkshire, it was a challenge to the decision of the department uh, to alter national policy for planning obligations of affordable housing. And the statutory criteria when making changing national policy via written ministerial decision, the statutory criteria weren't considered prior to making the written ministerial statement, but they were considered afterwards. So that's a clear source of example of what Bracking says you can't do. But actually, in this case, initially, Mr. Justice Holgate did quash the decision, but the Court of Appeal uh, disagreed. And even though there had been an initial breach, uh, they declined to exercise their jurisdiction. Uh, they declined to exercise their discretion to quash the decision. And what's interesting in this case is the Court of Appeal was, was careful to say that PSED is still very important. The fact that we're not quashing the decision doesn't mean that there wasn't a breach. So they didn't really refer to it as curing a breach or meaning that the breach went away. They approached it more in the sense of what remedy should we impose for the breach? And they decided in this case, just quashing for the sake of quashing wasn't justified. And so the final case I'm going to mention is just an interesting one because it's quite an extreme example of this happening in practice. Uh, this case concerned uh, the claimant applied for judicial review of the failure of the defendant to provide British sign language interpreters as part of the government's COVID briefings when everyone was tuning into those every day. There was no assessment um, conducted before the, um, before the decision. And remarkably, in this case, there was a public sector quality duty assessment, which was submitted, which was provided at 6.30 p.m., uh, one working day prior to the claimant skeleton argument being due. So I have to admit, I do feel quite sorry for the claimant's barrister in this case, whoever they were. And so in this case, the, the public sector quality duty, the assessment wasn't just done afterwards. It wasn't just done late. It was done after judicial review proceedings had been started. And actually, it was done after they'd been granted permission and just weeks before the substantive hearing when the claimant skeleton argument was due. So this was really quite late. And it was clear that it was, as it were, a last minute job done after judicial review proceedings. But Mr. Justice Fordham found that um, there was no reason to quash in this case 
He said, based on the evidence he'd seen, there was no evidence that there was an agenda or that this was a rear guard action. He was satisfied that it was a rigorous evaluation done with an open mind. And in that, and for those reasons, there was no reason to quash. So turning to some just general conclusions, what's to be drawn from this? The first and very obvious point is it's much better if you're a public authority to discharge the duty before you make a decision. There are certain things you can do afterwards, but it's obviously much better if you can to do it beforehand. The second point is that it can be a little bit more complicated in an iterative process. So Lord Justice Nagy in the case of Metropolitan Housing mentioned that there's a line of authority saying you can't cure a breach that concerns one-off decisions. And so it might be a bit different when it's a one-off decision, but when it's something a bit more iterative, then it's not quite so clear cut when the decision's being made and what you can do afterwards. The third point is um, that the PSED is a continuing duty. So if it is an iterative process to always keep the assessment under review to make sure you have up-to-date information and evidence. Fourth general point is following the extreme example given in the case decided by Mr. Justice Fordham, there is some scope for avoiding quashing of a decision even after judicial review proceedings are brought. But in order to do that, the court is going to be very alive to the possibility that what's been done is a response to the judicial review proceedings and is not a genuine assessment. And so it's a rather uncomfortable position to be in, but it is possible to do. And then the final point really is for claimants is that it's really important based on all this case law to consider what the remedy is likely to be, even if you are able to successfully demonstrate breach. So just demonstrating breach is of course the necessary first step if you're a claimant, but it's not the end of the story. You still need to consider if the court is actually gonna go on and quash the decision, which is what you want it to do. So I think that's my time. So let me stop screen sharing. Thanks, Michael. Um just stop share there we go <laughs> right thanks um thanks michael that was a really helpful reminder of the scope of the pscd and uh when breaches can be remedied um moving on then to our second speaker uh mero golden um mero was called to the bar in 2014 and is one of ftb's rising stars um she's developed a broad public law practice with extensive experience acting in judicial and statutory review proceedings um, Mero has also been involved in a number of high, high profile public law cases, uh, including the recent challenge to the Mayor of London's ULES scheme. Um, and in recent years, she's also gained particular experience in education law, appearing regularly in the special educational needs appeals um, before the first tier tribunal. Uh, Mero will be speaking about two key recent cases on the public sector equality duty. So um, without further ado, Mero, uh, take it away. Thanks so much, Flora, and hopefully you can all see and hear me and uh, see my slides, which I um, <laughs> I think was very keen and, and started sharing before um, I, I should have done. So um, here are my slides, uh, and, and also a huge thanks to Michael as well um, for providing that great overview um, just now. Um, I'm afraid I have uh, no catchy title for my uh, talk, but as, as Flora says, it's really just two recent cases over this last summer, uh, one from the Supreme Court, which is the Maroof case, and then the Waltham case, which is uh, from the Court of Appeal, which I thought were interesting. Um, so without further ado, I'll, I'll kick off. Uh, with Maroof. Now the facts uh, are on the on the slides, which you will be getting. Uh, I understand a copy of these slides uh, for those of you asking for that. Um, and so the facts are uh, really that there was a, a an ex gratia resettlement scheme for refugees fleeing the Syrian conflict, and access to that scheme was limited to those who had been referred by the UNHCR. Now the appellant had fled the Syrian conflict, but she was a Palestinian refugee, and um, she was unable to therefore access this scheme because as a Palestinian refugee she fell under the exclusive mandate of the UN, um, UN's Relief and Works Agency and so could not be subject to a referral by the UNHCR. So those are the underlying facts for this case. Um, but the legal issue uh, and the main issue was agreed um, that it was all to do with what is the territorial scope 
of the public sector equality duty. Now, a bit of background to the proceedings. The High Court, and it was again um, Mrs Justice Lang, uh, had considered, um, she considered herself bound by previous authority to divisional court uh, decisions to find that the PSED did have extraterritorial effect. Um, and she went on to find that there was a breach of um, Section 1491B in this case. By the time of the Court of Appeal hearing, there had actually been a further um, Pub policy equality statement that had been published and so going back actually to what Michael was covering you had a situation where actually the question of whether there'd been a breach had so somewhat become academic but the Secretary of State still appealed uh, at the Court of Appeal pursued a cross appeal at the Court of Appeal on this point about whether the public sector equality duty had extraterritorial reach and that's the point that that led up to the Supreme Court now for completeness the app um, the appellant was really making two alternative arguments I don't have time to go into to do just to both of those and the second one I, I, I might add you might need a bit of more of a, a strong cup of coffee to, to, to read through it but it is interesting so please do have a look at that but I'm going to focus here on the first argument which really was does um, section 149 as a whole have extraterritorial effect and this is the spoiler slide uh, the answer in short is no. Um, so public bodies are not required to have due regard to um, the goals in section 149 when exercising their functions so far as that exercise is affecting people living outside the UK. And so they're not, so essentially the PSE does not bind them uh, on the extraterritorial effect, but it is worth looking at the Supreme Court's uh, reasoning in a bit more detail. So the Supreme Court um, sort of started with uh, what they refer to as the well-established principle that there is a presumption against any legislation having extraterritorial effect. Now that presumption can be rebutted by express words, it can be rebutted by implication, but it's a, a, high, um, a high threshold. The appellant had been relying on previous Supreme Court authorities to say, well, actually the presumption really only arises here if um, extraterritorial effect of a statutory duty would have an issue. So would uh, undermine international comity, for example, or interfere with um, state sovereignty in other countries. But the Supreme Court reviewed previous authorities and said, um, essentially concluded that none of them had had the effect of watering down that presumption or narrowing it. The presumption applies uh, essentially always. Um, and, and, and so the Supreme Court did a helpful review of, of that. I mentioned that the High Court had um, felt bound by previous divisional court authorities. These are the two cases in question. So it's one for your note, uh, if, you, if you're coming across these. On this point, um, the Supreme Court looked at these two cases and in the Hotak case, which concerned uh, another excretia scheme uh, for Afghan nationals who had helped British forces overseas uh, in Afghanistan. And the complaint in that case was that the scheme set up for them was not as uh, generous as the one for that was set Set up uh, in Iraq uh, and the court in Hotak had found a breach of the public sector quality duty and there was no cross appeal on the point about extraterritorial effect and, and the court of appeal didn't deal with it either. In Horo, um, the, this concerned the resettlement of the uh, Chagos Islanders, the Secretary of State actually conceded in that case that because the decision itself fell within the UK, was taken within the UK, the public sector quality duty uh, applied, even though it was affecting people and territories overseas, and followed hot act and the court proceeded on that basis, And but in that case actually found no breach. Um, the Supreme Court uh, in Maroof looked at these two cases and said, well, in neither case did they actually look at this presumption against extraterritorial effect, or did they have, uh, uh, did they really look at the case law on that? Uh, and so went along with the High Court and the Court of Appeal in the Maroof proceedings and disapproved uh, these two cases to the extent that they found uh, that extraterritorial effect. Um, now, the appellant uh, ha had argued in, in Maroof that um, the, the public sector quality duty had extraterritorial effect, they said, even though in most cases they recognised um, that, that there's unlikely to be uh, much of an impact of that, whether that's because the decision in question won't actually affect anyone outside of the UK, or because even if it does, there's very little that the public authority in the UK can actually do to sort of uh, achieve the aims in the public sector quality duty in section 149 in relation to the decision. So the appellant was saying, really, even though, you know, they were saying the public sector quality duty has uh, extraterritorial effect, but in many cases, the burden um, would have been very easy to discharge. Um, uh, and, and so it's not going to add much of a burden, it's effectively what they were saying. 
But the Supreme Court held that actually, well, they turned that on its head really against the appellant and said, well, if in most cases it's not going to have much of an impact, we say it's actually less likely that Parliament intended this statute and the statutory duty to apply extraterritorially. So they sort of spun that against the appellant, uh, as it were. In my view, I think underlying the decision, and this is one of the things that's particularly interesting about it, was I think the Supreme Court was was recognising the practical issues that would have arisen if the um, duty did apply extraterritorially. This is a quote on the slide from the Court of Appeal decision, but it was endorsed by the Supreme Court as well. And um, you can see, I'm not going to read it all out, but it's for your for your note. Uh, but you can see really grappling with the issues and the, the sentence and underline you can see says uh, it cannot be for a public authority in this country, the UK, to determine how best to advance equality of opportunity between people subject to foreign law, traditions and customs. So I think that's quite interesting. And in a way, it's almost a comedy type point. Uh, and certainly elsewhere in the Supreme Court's judgment, I think there was recognition of the, the risks of public authorities here foraying into what could be quite sensitive issues about equality um, situations in other countries. And um, Further on that, uh, and, and I thought this was particularly interesting, it might just be me, but um, uh, this is a, another quote from the Supreme Court's judgment here, um, which I thought was interesting because it really was honing in and saying, well, the PSED is really about, um, through a procedural duty, seeking to um, achieve societal change and improvement, um, and whether that's enhancing equality opportunity or enhancing good relations, and, and to basically be seeking societal change in the community, but their def definition of the community is the UK community and not um, the community overseas. So I thought that was also uh, quite interesting. Now, in the interest of time, I, I, I think most of this line is probably for your note, but needless to say, the, the court explained also why limiting the PSED uh, in this way would not undermine its purpose, in particular on public accountability, which was one of the benefits of the PSED. Um, the court found that that really it didn't stretch to people, uh, the need for public accountability didn't stretch to people outside of the UK, put simply. And I've also added this floodgates point, which actually came up in relation to the appellant's alternative arguments. Um, but I thought was an interesting, again, an interesting possible underlying concern of the court, which is that really, if we if we did open the doors here, then, you know, people all over the world could effectively challenge decision making processes in the UK um, uh, on the basis that they affected uh, them outside of the UK. So I thought thought all of that was was worth noting. And I mean, of course, just because the PSED doesn't bite doesn't mean um, that a public authority cannot choose to have regard to the matters uh, covered within it. Uh, and that sort of leads on to this final slide on the roof, which is very important to note, which is where the court reiterated that just because the public sector equality duty as a statutory duty doesn't apply extraterritorially, that's not to say um, that there may, um, well, effectively, that there may still be cases where the kind of factors that are listed in section 149 are so germane to the decision at hand that actually they need to be considered just as a matter of ordinary principles of judicial review. Um, so it's worth having that in the back of your minds as well. Uh, whilst the PSED doesn't have extraterritorial effect uh, uh, as a statutory duty, um, it may be under usual principles of JR that um, uh, international impacts of a decision need to be considered and the examples were given where courts have actually examined how governments have assessed uh, the international impacts of their decisions uh, overseas. So I think that's that's um, useful as well. And then in the time available, if I have time available, I, I did also want to cover this, this Court of Appeal authority in Waltham Forest. Um, the facts, again, on the slide, uh, the appellant was a single mother with three children. She lived in London all her life. All her friends and family were in London. And unfortunately, she was made an unintentionally homeless. Now, the local authority had a um, housing duty um, under the Housing Act um, to provide accommodation um, for her. And they discharged that duty by offering her private sector um, a private sector short hold tenancy uh, with a fixed term of 24 months. The issue was that the offer was in Walsall, uh, so nowhere near London um, or the surrounding areas um, up, in, up in the West Midlands. 
And the appellant challenged uh, the reviewing officers because that decision was, was um, there was a review of that decision and, and the appellant challenged the officer's decision that the offer was suitable. Um, now the reviewing officer had concluded uh, that uh, there was really no suitable accommodation in the London or the surrounding areas. And in any event, the appellant was unlikely uh, to be able to afford it um, due to, and this is the important bit really, due to the fact the appellant um, was subject to the benefits cap. So that, that's the, the, the really important bit because the appeal ground, as you can see, um, related to whether there was a breach of section 149 um, by failing to consider the discriminatory impact of moving the appellant um, out of the borough due to her being impacted by the benefits cap. And the appellant really was arguing that the benefits cap and the way it was impacting on affordability was, the, was really being used as a proxy um, to determine what accommodation uh, was suitable for applicants. And then they went on to say that put women at a disadvantage. It may amount to ind di indirect discrimination, but um, in any event, the reviewing officer had to have due regard to the matters in section uh, 149. Now, the reason I've flagged this case is because I think it is a reminder of some of the principles, uh, um, the general principles of PSED. So firstly, that PCD is context specific. So here the Court of Appeal was saying uh, you need to look at the PCD in the context of the particular housing functions at issue. And it was accepted that local authority could discharge their housing duty by making the offer that they did, um, uh, as long as they found that that accommodation was suitable. And moreover, it was um, it, within the housing, uh, particularly particular housing statutory framework, the the local authority actually had to consider various um, factors which included whether the accommodation was affordable so in looking at it in context uh, the court of appeal ultimately concluded that the local authority had not used the benefits cap as a proxy and it also had regard to the, the local authority's policy uh, on um, uh, the discharge of their housing duties um, it, the Court of Appeal also held that on the facts, the reviewing officer hadn't um, breached the public sector equality duty. Uh, but again, it's that emphasis of the context specific point. I should also note the last bullet point, which goes back as well to, to Michael's, what Michael was um, mentioning earlier, which is the, the court went on to say, even if there had been a breach of the um, PSED here, the decision would have inevitably have been the same in any event. So again, that harks back to what Michael was covering earlier. And just still on that context specific point, this is a huge amount of text. Um, so I'm not expecting you to read it all now in light of time, but I, I did want to include it in the slide because it's a very useful quote making that point from um, a case of Sheikh, which is from the Court of Appeal, uh, and it was picked up in the Maroof Supreme Court judgment as, as reflecting that context specific um, aspect of the, the due regard principle, um, which is a, a nightmare perhaps for lawyers, but it is, at least it's useful um, to know how just how sort of fact specific and flexible the court will be when looking at what is due regard in a particular circumstance. And then the last point uh, on, on the Waltham Forest case is really that um, the court called out that the appellant, they said in this case, was in reality seeking a different substantive uh, decision. Uh, now, the background really is that the appellant had been suggesting that the local authority here could have offered them temporary accommodation uh, rather than the, the fixed term offer that they made. And if they'd done, if they'd offered temporary accommodation, then um, the, the housing cost of that would have been paid for by housing benefits from the local authority. And it wouldn't have impacted on the benefits, um, the universal credit that the appellant was receiving. Uh, and the Court of Appeal rather crudely said that in reality, the appellant was seeking a different substantive outcome and not really, um, there wasn't, you know, wasn't really targeting the issue of the, whether the public sector quality duty had been complied with. The duty and the public sector quality duty, as, as Michael has mentioned, is a procedural duty only. And so that was emphasised again in this case. And I'll just finish by adding that certainly something that I, I've come across in practice um, uh, certainly within uh, uh, inspectors decisions is sometimes slipping up in terms of how the public sector quality duty is described uh, in terms of that procedure versus substantive point. So for example, I've certainly seen some decision makers say, well, um, I think that this project or this proposal that's in front of me does or does not comply with the public sector quality duty uh, or the public sector quality is, is not met by this project. And um, I think, what you know, arguably that's a matter of semantics it's unlikely probably to trip up a decision maker um fatally but 
uh, I think it's still worth being aware of. It's not you know, the public sector policy duty. It's not about whether a project meets it or not. It's about whether the decision makers assessment of the project meets the public sector quality duty or not because it's procedural only so um i just thought i'd finish on on that sort of caution point as well but that that's all i have to cover flora um thank you very much mero um our last speaker for today then is leo Taralambides. um leo is an expert expert public law barrister who is regularly instructed to provide advice in judicial review proceedings and particularly those relating to local government constitutional arrangements and powers uh, and Leo is also ranked as one of the leading juniors in licensing law um, so on that theme today his talk will be focusing on the public sector equality duty in the context of the licensing act and sexual entertainment venues uh, so Leo um, over to you. Thank you very much and um, welcome everyone. Let me just see, oh, why is this not, am I sharing my screen? Yes, you are. Oh, good. Um, so welcome. Um, so when I was thinking about this, I was thinking about the um, practical application uh, in the context of um, licensing, uh, local government licensing. And it struck me uh, that one of the um, sort of leading uh, silks in this area had commented in, in, in an article a couple of years back that the uh, Equality Act is not always understood or properly observed by uh, licensing authorities. Um, and I turned to one of the leading uh, textbooks on the subject uh, to see what mention was made of the Equalities Act and the PSED. Um, and this is, a, this is a great textbook that I use all the time. And it struck me that other than to uh, quote the following uh, guidance from the Section 182 guidance, uh, the textbook was silent. Uh, so I thought this would make a, a, a good topic for our, our discussion uh, today. Under the Licensing Act 2003, which concerns alcohol, uh, entertainment late night refreshment licensing, a local authority is required to have a statement of licensing policy. Uh, and in that statement of licensing policy, it should recognise uh, the uh, Equality Act and uh, its implications uh, and the need for uh, the local authority to engage with it. So the principles set out by, by Michael are, are very relevant. Uh, and the guidance goes further it's uh, suggested that the local authority should demonstrate its compliance with its equality duty on an annual basis. So considering things like training its members, uh, thinking about the development of its licensing policy uh, and uh, engagement through representations, uh, reviews uh, and, uh, and appeals. Um, but the reality that I found uh, up to this date is that this doesn't happen. Uh, and it's still the case that insofar as licensing is concerned, uh, we don't uh, fully understand or properly uh, observe it, though that is uh, changing. Uh, and it's changing for, for, for the better where, where it does happen. So for example, Manchester City Council um, stress the values of a fair and equal uh, society uh, and look to uh, engage the public sector equality duty in such a way uh, that delivers the best equality outcomes for uh, its uh, city. Whereas Westminster City Council goes further uh, and it looks at the public sector equality duty and it says that it goes beyond the protected characteristics that Michael uh, described. Uh, and so they look at uh, diversity, inclusion uh, of the entertainment and nighttime uh, economy, uh, and give the example of uh, venues which were denying people access on the basis that they don't look right or they don't fit. Uh, this resulted from a, a number of complaints uh, that Westminster then went on to, to investigate in its nighttime economy, where it was discovered that uh, women of particular sizes were uh, being refused access to venues or they were being charged extra. And similarly, um, women of color 
were equally being refused access to venues or um, or being charged uh, more expensive um, entry uh, fees. And so Westminster uh, developed within its statement of licensing policy what it expected not just of itself uh, as, a, as a local authority, and this sort of really touches on, on, on perhaps Mero's uh, final uh, point, but also the idea of what it expects others uh, in the licensing field uh, to achieve. Uh, so within its uh, consideration of the public sector equality duty, uh, Westminster commits itself uh, to thinking about whether a venue adopts best, best practice, uh, whether it has inclusive and um, transparent policies, not just in the terms of the protected characteristics, but also policies based on perceived attractiveness, size, or indeed the protective character characteristics itself. Can patrons complain? Are the venues accessible? Is there comprehensive uh, training? Uh, and how is that training uh, refreshed? Uh, so Westminster uh, as a policy really remains um, I think sort of the best example of what we have at the moment. But in this recent slew of, of reviews, uh, we're seeing greater emphasis on an awareness of the uh, public sector ecology duty. Um, and Westminster's policies also uh, help us consider how um, the duty might be discharged by uh, a licensing authority in a consultation with, in engagement with uh, an operator. So for example, uh, it could provide pre-application uh, advice. Uh, so where pre-application advice is sought, has the operator, have the local authority discussed things such as equality training, accessibility, entry requirements, whether those entry requirements uh, have uh, adverse uh, impacts during the determination of the licensing application or indeed on uh, reviews, uh, what, what impact will, have, will the determination have on those with uh, protected characteristics? Uh, so for example, in the recent Brixton Academy review case, uh, a venue that is well known uh, for promoting uh, music of black origin, uh, what would the effect of having that closed or, 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 or amended? Um, how do responsible authorities, so the police, environmental health, licensing, uh, safeguarding, how do they make representations in the context of uh, review applications and, um, and, and new applications? Uh, what about applying for reviews in appropriate circumstances? I don't yet know of a single example where a review has been based on uh, the public sector equality duty, uh, but I am aware of appeal decisions um, where the public sector equality duty uh, has been uh, engaged with uh, and grappled with uh, by the courts. Uh, so it is a, a, a developing uh, area uh, and some um, examples where it's used are, for example, in women's safety. To what extent does our entertainment and nighttime economy uh, promote uh, women's safety, women's access to the nighttime economy. What character does our, our our nighttime economies have? You know, for example, is there a particular strip that it might be associated with more perceived uh, masculine pursuits like uh, like stag do's, sports bars, and so on? How do women feel entering uh, those those areas? How? does the uh, local authority through its licensing policies, through its licensing decisions, think about how it designs uh, women's safety spaces. Uh, another area where the um, uh, duties are considered is around exploitation and safeguarding uh, around uh, workers, children, uh, women, uh, again, um, in the context of urban and music of uh, black origin. Uh, there's a real concern, which is um, the subject of a, of a high level uh, study at the moment uh, by, the, by the Mayor of London involving the Met and, and, and London local authorities, which looks at racial profiling and uh, the operation of live music events uh, will come across uh, review applications which will highlight 
urban music, music of black origin, and attempt to link that to uh, gangs uh, in the process, uh, both consciously and unconsciously, uh, making a link. Uh, to uh, racial profiling, which is having some interesting knock-on effects, including venues not being willing uh, to offer their spaces for uh, music of Black origin. Uh, and so that's uh, something to uh, consider. Uh, another example is looking at alcohol-free spaces, alcohol-free spaces uh, which provide uh, entertainment, late-night entertainment facilities uh, for um, for uh, the late night economy, but for those sectors of our community uh, that don't want to be in alcohol spaces, uh, but want a well lit late night uh, entertainment offering uh, that is available. Uh, and then also uh, regarding kink and fetish spaces. Uh, these are venues where consenting adults meet with uh, each other in order to uh, engage in recreational sexual practices. Um, In this context, then, when we're thinking about these, it's quite clear that not only are we looking at the public sector equality duty, but we're also thinking about other uh, strategies. Uh, so crime prevention, planning, transport, tourism, as well as equality schemes. Uh, and a great example of that would be um, the Women's Night Safety Charter that's provided by the Mayor of London, uh, which addresses equality, safety, crime, uh, prevention, and, um, and, and so on. I've listed some resources there from the Journal of Licensing. Uh, and I raise this question of, in the context of licensing, do we need an inequalities impact assessment? Is it a requirement? Who prepares it? Is it good practice? Just sort of building on some of the ideas of uh, that Michael uh, initially uh, raised. Um, and this occurred in a, in, in a recent case I was involved with around nudity uh, in uh, in a club in Tower Hamlets, which had a licensing act condition that said no nudity or semi-nudity. Uh, and this was prohibitive in terms of these kink spaces and these kink venues, uh, which people wanted to, to recreate with. And to put the matter uh, simply, given the amount of time uh, we have, uh, the question was, well, why is it lawful for a man uh, to dance with his top off, but, but not a woman? Uh, those of you with this uh, interest might be following the um, developments in Catalonia, uh, where uh, the government there, the local government there, is uh, promoting a policy which allows topless bathing in uh, public pools as a way of advancing equality. Uh, in that case, Tower Hamlets adopted a definition of nudity based on uh, the provisions of the 1982 Act that deal with uh, sexual establishments. Though in the course of their submissions, it recognised that uh, self-identification uh, could be uh, relevant. Uh, this was perceived as having a real impact because how is uh, a, an operator, the security, going to effectively police and regulate how other people uh, self-identified? Um, this case is discussed in, a, in an article that I've written for the journal and I've got the uh, Journal of Licensing and I've uh, written that for you there. Uh, interestingly enough, the uh, licensing authority in that case uh, addressed the issue of the public sector equality quite briefly. It looked at the uh, issue as uh, one of uh, wider diversity, inclusion, but also safety, uh, particularly uh, safeguarding. And they'd recognised that the, uh, the safeguarding, the accessibility, were such that the condition for the purposes of the Licensing Act 2003 were not to um, were not uh, were, 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 was not relevant. Uh, so they, they they removed that that condition. Uh, in that case, the local authority did not prepare an equality impact assessment. I don't believe that the uh, licensing officer had. And interestingly enough, it was the operator itself that took the equalities impact assessment. I acted, I acted for the operator. So I don't um, criticize the local authority because I don't think these are easy uh, to do in the context of uh, licensing. But we put together 
uh, an equalities impact assessment uh, in the best way that we you know we thought we 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 could with the experience that we had drawing on licensing consultants uh, statistics from the local authority the um, Tower Hamlets mayor uh, manifesto uh, and so on which is what uh, the uh, the committee relied on in terms of the evidential basis uh, to look at the public sector equality duty. Um, and so I suggest that there is an example of where there is insufficient uh, evidence uh, for the assessment. Uh, it can come from you know, an applicant rather than necessarily just for the local authority. And that may be enough uh, for the decision maker uh, to engage uh, with that. Uh, there are very few, in fact, there's only one case uh, that uh, deals with the public sector quality duty in the case of uh, licensing. Uh, and that's the recent Bournemouth case where the court held that uh, sex equality based concerns are not moral concerns, uh, that they are uh, genuine concerns that need to be grappled with and rigorously considered. Uh, and that's in the context of uh, sexual entertainment venues, uh, particularly lap dancing, table dancing uh, and the like, where there are quite polarised views, equally valid polarised views about the value of uh, freedom of expression, sex workers, as opposed to the way in which lap dancing is considered to contribute to a culture of objectification, qualification and discrimination. Uh, so this, once again, I think raises the importance of adjourning for equalities impact assessment, thinking about the sources of evidence and making sure that the decision maker has that information that they need in order to properly grapple with the decisions in an environment that they might not be familiar with, uh, which is why it seems to me that members, officers and legal advisors uh, need practical training on the application of the public sector equality duty, which needs to be regular and kept updated. The policy, the statement of licensing policy needs to be um, kept up to date, it needs to be reviewed at least annually as the guidance uh, suggests. Consideration needs to be given in terms of how representations are made and whether the PSED needs to be uh, raised there, what is the approach on, review, on applications, reviews uh, and uh, indeed uh, appeals. Um, I've only got a little bit of time left and I want to leave time for questions, but in these final slides, I also just want to draw your attention to uh, accessibility. Now, you'll recall I mentioned the importance of accessibility in the context of venues, but equally in terms of our taxi and private hire vehicles, minicabs, uh, the importance of the public sector equality duty uh, regarding uh, decisions relating to the provision of taxis and private hire is, uh, is very important. It doesn't relate just to uh, the vehicle services itself, but also the infrastructure uh, and the question of reasonable adjustments. So things like spacing at ranks, waiting areas, uh, wheelchair accessible vehicles, their supply, their design, even down to the street design uh, is important. Communication barriers, assistant dogs, uh, confidence barriers. You know, how do you um, deal with um, a blind person using apps, for example, how uh, can they uh, access a transport service uh, and how the exercise of the public sector equality duty contributes to an inclusive service plan, which of course is another example of uh, the integration of our wider policies. Uh, so it does seem to me that when thinking about the exercise of the public sector equality duties, there might be a temptation to deal with it in, in, in the silo, uh, deal with it on its own. But really, we can see that there are wider aspects uh, that we need to uh, engage with. Uh, and this will be particularly relevant where uh, Michael talked about the duty of inquiry. Uh, how far does your inquiry run? You know, is it enough to look at vehicles, number of vehicles, ranks, the spacing of ranks? Is it a highways issues, markings and so on? So there's a great deal of information that can usefully be used in order to bring um, our consideration of the public sector equality duty uh, really into, into practical effect, which will always be context specific. So the considerations to kink and fetish venues, lap dancing, taxis, 
venues that promote black music are going to be very different. And uh, officers, decision makers need to step out of their, their silo and really take quite a creative approach to get to grips with the context. And that to me is what it means to engage with these, um, this duty with the substance rigor and the open mind that is uh, required. I'd like to stop there because I have, um, I want to leave up some time for questions, but on my slide you'll see I've set out a, a few uh, articles from the Journal of Licensing uh, which deal with the uh, public sector equality duty in the context of uh, licensing. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, Flora, back to you. Um, thanks very much, Leo. Um, um, we have about five minutes and some questions have been put in the Q&A. Um, so I'll just um, pass those over to the speakers. Um, the first couple of questions, I think, are more uh, general questions, um, which uh, Michael and others can answer. Um, so first is, does the public sector quality duty apply to every function of a public authority? Um, and second, um, any tips from an ed evidential point of view for demonstrating breach of a public sector equality duty by a public authority? Uh, so on the first one, which functions does it apply to? Uh, so section 150 of the Equality Act defines public function. It defines it rather circularly as um, anything that's defined as a public fu function in the HRA, the Human Rights Act. <laughs> Um, but in practice, uh, a public function is very broad, really. Um, and there's some useful guide, uh, there's technical guidance from the Equality and Human Rights Commission. That's actually quite useful in general, but it also has some specific guidance on this point. And you have to think about things about whether your exercising power is assigned under legislation, whether it's akin to a uh, government role things like that. But in, in general, the courts have um, taken a very broad approach to what a public function is. Um, the only other thing to add on that is Schedule 18 of the Equality Act does list some exceptions, but they're pretty narrow. There's to do with um, some, some functions related to children, some functions related to immigration, but um, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. And um, would anyone like to take on the question about um, demonstrating breach of, a, of the public sector quality duty by a claimant? Well, um, <laughs> I'll do this one and then I won't do any others. <laughs> Just uh, quickly. So the, the PSED, it's, it's, re it's for the public authority to show that they discharged it. So in that sense, just in terms of demonstrating breach, if you're claiming it's more about poking holes in what's there, it might be worth considering um, in certain circumstances, there might be an assessment in the background that you just haven't seen. Um, so you might want to make a freedom of information request to make sure you've got everything in front of you. Or also that's what pre-action letters are for. If you write a pre-action letter raising the argument, um, they might come back with an assessment. But really, I think for the claimant, based on what I was saying in terms of curing breach, probably the most important thing for evidence is to show why it matters, um, because you're not going to you're not going to quash the decision, even if there has been a breach, unless you convince the court that it would have made a difference or um, it really matters. So the focus, the focus should be on the impact, probably, if you're a claimant. I'll be quiet now. <laughs> um, great. Thanks, Michael. Um, if nobody had anything to add on that point, um, there are a couple of other questions. Um, I think one about the Westminster licensing policy specifically, so that's probably for you, um, Leo, about um, whether the Westminster licensing policy advocates certain substantive outcomes rather than demonstrating procedural compliance with the public sector equality duty. It asks applicants to have policies in place to be able to demonstrate those policies as part of its operating schedule, uh, to have training in place, uh, and it says that it will have an expectation that they will, uh, that the applicant will think about diversity and inclusivity, and if they don't, its officers when making representations 
are encouraged to raise that so that the applicant that can appear before the committee in order to address issues around um, diversity and inclusion. Um, so, yeah. Thanks, Leo. And just one final question then, um, which is, um, do any of the speakers have an idea of um, what are the commonest areas of public decision making that generally get challenged on PSED grounds and if there's any trend in that regard? Probably falls to me, but I'm not, <laughs> I'm not sure I necessarily have a very good answer because I, I'm not sure I can speak um, authoritatively on it. But certainly what I can say is I think we do see it quite quite regularly in the area of law that a lot of us work in, in planning and environmental and really uh, in housing um, context of housing schemes and use of uh, land, it does come up quite a lot. And I think what I would add is um, it, it's, you know, in terms of um, looking at failures to comply with the PSED, I mean, I suppose you're looking for, for failures to even think about some of the issues. Um, and it may be more likely that those that those types of failures um, arise in a context where you're dealing with a decision that has lots and lots of different impacts uh, and the statutory scheme or the decision at issue itself doesn't direct naturally or inherently the decision maker's mind to all of those impacts. So sometimes in some areas of law, you might have a, a situation where just by dint of, of the decision at hand, it, it, it's almost implied that um, the decision maker might well be taking into account the kinds of factors in Section 149. If you've got a, a, a decision where that doesn't have that sort of focus um, just inherently within it, then there may be more risk, uh, if you follow me, of um, missing out uh, uh, some of the PSED type of impacts uh, in your assessment. So yeah, I'm not sure if that helps, Flora. But... Thanks, Mario. Um... No, that is really helpful. Um, so I we're just one minute over time, so I think it's good to uh, wrap up there. Thank you to everyone for leaving your questions and also thank you to our three speakers um, and those of you who've attended the session today. Um, this was the third in FTB's 2023 public law webinar series. Um, the final seminar for the year will be taking place on the 24th of October um, and will broadly be focused on legislation. So important new primary legislation, challenges to secondary legislation and statutory interpretation. You can sign up for that um, webinar on the FTB events page or the link is also in the uh, chat box if um, you want to find it now. Uh, so thanks all for attending and um, have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, Flora. Thanks, Flora. Yep.